Hi, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dawn Castor. Um, I recently joined the Division of Nephrology um, as assistant professor this last July. Um, before that, I was a fellow. Before that, I was in your all shoes, so it hasn't been too terribly long. Um, the goal of this talk is to go over nephrotic syndrome. Um, it's kind of a continuation of what we talked about last week with glomerulonephritis. Um, I have uh, put in a lot of board re review questions throughout my talk um, because I know that's uh, important for you all to know, get out of this lecture what you need to know for internal medicine boards. Now the questions I have in here are, I think, two mixed apps behind what you have, so hopefully there'll be new questions, um, but I think they're still relevant. So here um, I have some beautiful pictures of the podocyte, which is um, important in any proteinuric uh, kidney disease, especially with nephrotic syndrome. You have to have significant podocyte damage um, in order to have nephrotic syndrome. So um, here you have normal podocytes on electron microscopy and effaced podocytes here. Um, here's a scanning EM of the podocyte with its foot processes um, you know, over the capillary. So very interesting pictures. So you can imagine if they're damaged, you know, protein slips through, and that's how we develop nephrotic syndrome. So defining it, um, you will read different uh, definitions. In general, we define it as protein excretion greater than three to three and a half grams a day. Um, you know, depending on whether you follow the three or three and a half grams, as uh, Sometimes it depends on body habitus, also um, serum albumin levels. So if someone has 3 grams of proteinuria and their albumin is 1.8, even though they're below that 3.5 grams per day, they definitely have clinically significant um, you know, protein loss. So we still would probably define them as having nephrotic syndrome. So the syndrome itself, so just the protein excretion is what we would define as nephrotic range proteinuria. The syndrome itself includes edema, uh, hypoalbuminemia, hyperlipidemia, and lipiduria. So abnormalities associated with nephrotic syndrome include edema, hyperlipidemia, and cardiovascular disease, thromboembolism, and the reason I have this starred is because in my mix-up review, um, there were two questions. Uh, related to this, so this is something that they like to ask about on boards. Um, endocrine abnormalities, infection um, because of the loss of uh, immunoglobulin and, um, you know, basically leading to immunosuppression. Uh, anemia and acute renal failure are all abnormalities associated with nephrotic syndrome. Now, the acute renal failure uh, frequently is because of ATN, because of um, severe intravascular volume depletion that um, can occur with uh, nephrotic syndrome. Uh, so essentially, you know, a prolonged uh, pre-renal state. So acute renal failure is common with nephrotic syndrome and frequently is because of um, low intravascular uh, volume and then subsequent ATN. So uh, because they like to ask questions about uh, the thrombophilic state that is associated with nephrotic syndrome, I thought I'd you know, briefly go over uh, some of the reasons why they think that's present. So um, they think it's been hypothesized, and there are some uh, studies to support that uh, there's an increase of factors that promote thrombosis um, and a decrease of factors that prevent thrombosis. So uh, through proteinuria, you have, you know, the loss of antithrombin-3 and possibly protein CNS. Um, and there's also increased platelet and platelet aggregation. So I uh, had this slide last week. Um, these are the common renal pathology classifications and kind of the nephritic and nephrotic syndromes. Uh, we went over most of the nephritic syndromes last week, so uh, the focus this week is going to be on nephrotic syndromes, and I'm going to focus on uh, primary 
uh, nephrotic syndrome, so minimal change disease, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, and member membranous nephropathy. Um, diabetic nephropathy, myeloma kidney, and amyloidosis are all uh, systemic diseases that can also lead to nephrotic syndrome. Um, and it's important that you know about them, um, but since we have limited time. So minimal change disease is defined by a podocyte effacement. So I don't have a picture of light microscopy on here because there is no difference in minimal change diseases, which is why it has its name, between the normal kidney and disease kidney on light microscopy. So you really have to look at the EM. Um, here's a depiction, a pictorial depiction of the normal capillary loop and the podocytes, and then in minimal change disease, you have podocyte effacement. Um, I think you can clearly see this is normal podocytes, and this is what foot process effacement looks like on electron microscopy. So I'll also to note there are several reported secondary causes of minimal change disease. Some have more evidence than others, but um, all of these drugs, especially um, NSAIDs, um, have been associated with minimal change disease, um, thymoma, malignancies, graft-versus-host disease, um, and food allergy has also been associated. So the treatment of minimal change disease um, is similar in adults as it is in children. Uh, the first-line treatment is with prednisone, uh, one milligram per kilogram per day, or 120 milligrams every other day for at least 16 weeks uh, before changing therapy. Um, if someone is not responsive to steroids or um, they become steroid dependent or resistant, uh, you can use either combined uh, cytotoxic agents, usually cyclophosphamide and uh, prednisone, or uh, cyclosporin as an alternative. Um, typically, the big difference between how minimal change disease is treated from children to adults is adults take longer and have a lower response to therapy. So in children, you expect a pretty high response rate at four weeks, where in adults, you have to wait longer. Um, yes, I think I have a slide showing the efficacy, but um, they are essentially equally efficacious. Uh, so the complete remission uh, usually occurs in 60 to 70 percent of adults with prednisone alone, um, and the relapse rate is 20 to 40 percent. Um, the remission rate increases with cyclophosphamide to 85 percent, and relapses are less common. Um, of course, cyclophosphamide also has other toxicities, so a lot of times we don't use it in young people because it has a gonadal toxicity. Um, the remission rate um, is greater than 90% with cyclosporin, but it has a high relapse rate. So these are things we weigh the risks and benefits of in clinic when seeing patients. So this is the answer to your question. So. The time to remission in adults uh, with daily or alternate day steroids is shown here. You can see they um, overlap. So the solid line is all, and then the small dots are every other day, and the dashes are daily. So you can see um, that this is in adults. They take longer. So at four weeks, a pretty small percentage have um, actually reach remission. Um, when you take that out to 16 weeks, it's much higher. And some patients, you know, will take even longer to, to respond. So um, we tend to wait a little bit more patiently in adults uh, with nephrotic syndrome for a response to therapy than the pediatric nephrologists do. And then this is the frequency of relapse. So um, this is relapse-free. So about 60% of patients are relapse-free at 25 weeks. So there's a pretty high incidence of relapse. And this goes for a lot of uh, 
the nephrotic syndrome, so with a membranous or um, minimal change disease or FSGS, uh, relapses are common. So if you have a patient in clinic uh, that somehow got lost to follow-up with uh, nephrology and they have a history of nephrotic syndrome that was treated and you check a UA and they have a lot of proteinuria, um, that would be a definite reason to send them back to us because relapses are very common in the nephrotic syndromes. So FSGS um, has several kind of subcategories, and it is based on the light microscopy depiction. So you have classic FSGS, which um, also is frequently called FSGS NOS or not otherwise specified, and that's kind of your classic focal and segmental sclerotic lesions with occasional uh, global sclerosis. There's collapsing, um, which gives you kind of a collapsed appearance of the glomerulus. The Basically, you don't have any um, open capillary loops. They look like they've collapsed on themselves. And I'm going to show pictures here in a minute. And collapsing form is also frequently associated with HIV. Uh, the tip lesion um, is where scarring is limited to the tip or the tubular side of the glomerulus. And perihilar is where scarring appears at the vascular pole. And it's often associated with renal hyperfiltration, which is um, one of the causes of secondary FSGS. And here's a kind of more classic picture. So where you have part of the glomeruli that's all scarred down and part that looks relatively spared. Um, here's an example of collapsing, where basically you have a lot of open space because um, essentially the glomerulus looks like it's you know, collapse on itself, and you can see with the silver staining that essentially all these capillaries just look like they're smooshed down to one side. This is the tip lesion. So you have your vascular pole over here, and this is at the opposite end. And this is an example of perihilar. So why is it important to make these distinctions? Uh, there are differences in renal survival. So collapsing variant has the worst renal survival. Um, these other variants, there's a lot of overlap. It used to be thought that the tip lesion, and some people still think the tip lesion is the best prognosis. It's the most responsive to therapy. Although as you get several years out, it kind of crosses over. You can see with the um, NOS variant. The perihilar variant might be a little bit worse because it's usually uh, secondary to other causes, so it's less, less amenable to um, immunosuppression therapy. So the treatment, so the treatment of idiopathic FSGS is usually um, with prednisone as first line. Um, so you can do 60 milligrams daily or 120 milligrams every other day. Um, Second line are in patients who have contraindications to steroids. We usually use uh, calcineurin inhibitors. Um, and then other agents have been used, like cyclophosphamide and MMF for resistant patients. And I have this slide up here uh, to note the importance of even a um, partial remission. So this is a slide of someone who did not remit at all, so they still have maintain nephrotic proteinuria. And you can see the renal survival is very poor. This is someone that has achieved a partial remission, and this is someone that has received a full remission. So you can see that patients who have uh, achieved partial remission, where they have subnephrotic proteinuria, they might still have, say, 2 grams of proteinuria, still have a much better survival than patients who have uh, no remission. So um, we're usually happy if we get any remission at all, whether it be partial or full, because we know long-term that patient's going to do better. So this is a big slide um, of the secondary causes of FSGS. Uh, so hyperfiltration is kind of a general category um, so this can occur in patients with unilateral renal agenesis or hypoplasia, um, anyone that has nephrectomy or uh, obesity is something that 
they like to test on, although I still question this because we have a lot of obesity and we don't have a lot of FSGS out there. Um, reflux interstitial nephropathy, um, basically because of the nephron loss associated with it, um, leads to hyperfiltration. Um, and any of these are frequently seen with the perihilar variant. Um, the big question that they like to talk about on board exams is HIV-associated nephropathy. And this can be the classical variant or the uh, collapsing variant. Uh, several other viral infections have been associated with it, toxic agents, um, any of the interferons actually, not just interferon gamma, um, and they've actually been associated with the collapsing variant as well. Uh, ischemia, aging, um, just because of the way um, you can have an FSGS-type pattern uh, from glomerulosclerosis. Um, and, of course, there are several hereditary conditions. These tend to be seen in uh, children rather than adults, but there are some mutations that occur, um, you know, in young adulthood. And usually these patients will have a family history. All right, moving on. So here's a case presentation. A 54-year-old African-American woman presents with full nephrotic syndrome, including 24-hour urine protein of 5.8 grams, serum albumin of 2.2 grams per deciliter, edema, recent 25-pound weight gain, um, past medical history significant for hypertension, arthritis, and she had been treating herself with NSAIDs, um, morbid obesity. Those are her medications. Blood pressure is 140 over 100, 2-plus pitting edema of the lower extremities, and a weight of 273 pounds. Her creatinine was 0.82 with a bland urine sediment. All serologies are negative, um, including ANA, anti-double-stranded DNA, hepatitis B surface antigen, hep C, ANCA, rheumatoid factor, complements. Uh, there is no evidence of monoclonal serum or urine spike. Initial treatment consisted of discontinuation of meloxicam and the addition of an ACE um, or ARB, sorry. Two months later, uh, nephrotic perimeters were unchanged, so she went underwent kidney biopsy. I'll just go over the biopsy findings. So the capillary walls are thickened over here. It's kind of classic. You can see on silver staining these kind of spiky lesions. This is a immunofluorescence for IgG, which is in kind of a granular diffuse pattern along the capillary walls, and here you have subepithelial immune complex deposits. So this is membranous nephropathy. So here uh, our case, you know, this came out in nephrology, um, the, our nephsap. Uh, so it, they gave you a, a few other things that might be confusing, like the NSAID use. Um, which actually can cause a secondary um, membranous, but uh, she's middle-aged. Uh, she has bland pertinuria, no history of um, diabetes. So membranous nephropathy is either the number one or number two cause of nephrotic syndrome in, um, in adults, uh, depending on which study you believe. So uh, there's primary and secondary membranous nephropathy, um, it's real important to note secondary causes. The big one that they like to ask about on medicine boards is malignancy, so solid tumors especially. Less frequently hematologic malignancies, but they have been associated before. Uh, drugs, so NSAID use. Um, also uh, graft-versus-host disease, um, renal transplant, Sjogren's, sarcoid, and infections. Usually... Um, membranous is more associated with hepatitis B and not hepatitis C, so we talked about last week that MPGN is usually associated with hepatitis C. And then there are other infections that are, are related to uh, secondary causes of membranous. So as far as uh, we went over some of the secondary causes, so idiopathic membranous nephropathy, 
um, no longer needs to be called idiopathic, at least for 70 to 80 percent of the cases. So we um, have a big clue as to what causes the pathogenesis. So um, for several years, we knew that it was caused by um, basically immune complex formation under the podocyte. So um, it was thought that it was a native podocyte protein and circulating immune globulins that formed immune complexes, damaged the podocyte, and led to membranous nephropathy. And that was based on an animal model for several um, years. Uh, it was unknown what the target was. So I like to highlight this study. Um, it was, came out in 2009 in the New England Journal. Um, and I don't think you'll be asked any questions about it, but it really has changed the way we think about membranous nephropathy in nephrology. And it's the uh, phospholipase A2 receptor is the target antigen in idiopathic membranous nephropathy. Uh, we are lucky to be here at U of L, where Dr. David Powell, actually Tim Cummins was a, a graduate student that's now no longer here, but he was here, and uh, Dr. Klein um, were part of the discovery of this. Um, and essentially, using uh, samples from patients and proteomics, they were able to kind of hone in on this uh, uh, phospholipase A2 receptor, but. Uh, I don't want to go too much into the basic science behind it, but here is a, a immunofluorescence where you have the immunoglobulin, which IgG4 is actually the specific IgG uh, that is com most common in membranous nephropathy. And this is the PLA2R, which is the, the protein. And um, this area here shows that they co-localize. So um, essentially they found that it's antibodies to this specific protein, which is a protein on podocytes that cause this. And it has a lot of implications for future diagnosis and treatment of disease. Um, it is now commercially available in Europe, and it should be commercially available here soon, so that we might be ordering phospholipase A2 receptor antibody levels on patients with nephrotic syndrome and not having to biopsy them. We're not there yet, but Hopefully in the next five years we will be there. So you can see this is an additional study showing that 80% of patients with what was termed idiopathic membranous nephropathy had uh, antibodies to this protein. Um, and other secondary forms of membranous nephropathy levels were um, not elevated. Interesting, so cancer-related membranous nephropathy, um, some of these patients about I guess it's 25% uh, did have PLA2R positivity, whether that's because uh, they had kind of two separate things going on or uh, there's something about the malignancy that made them develop antibodies to PLA2R is unknown. But I guess the take-home point from this is just because someone's PLA2R positive doesn't mean you don't need to rule out malignancy. Um, interesting, too, is that these levels fall with remission, um, so they might be a good biomarker to follow uh, treatment courses. So here's a slide just showing that the natural history of membranous nephropathy is related to protein excretion. So patients with subnephrotic proteinuria that have membranous tend to do very well and have long-term renal survival. Uh, patients who um, are severely nephrotic tend not to. Um, important things to note, too, is that there's a high incidence of remission and untreated membranous nephropathy. So uh, the treatment, because there's a high incidence of spontaneous remission, uh, the treatment of membranous nephropathy varies. It's important to distinguish between low-risk, moderate-risk, and high-risk patients. So low-risk patients are those with uh, relatively low uh, protein excretion and normal kidney function. Um, and they don't necessarily need immunosuppression. Moderate risk are those in the 4 to 8 grams per day, and high risk are greater than 8 grams per day, uh, and or abnormal kidney function. So in the patients in the low risk category to moderate risk, you can always start with just uh, conservative therapy with ACE inhibitors and diuretics. Um, usually we monitor these patients for a six-month well, we monitor them long-term, but if in uh, 
over a six-month period, they move into uh, a moderate or high-risk group, um, they're candidates to immunosuppression. Uh, if they stay in the low-risk category, then you don't necessarily have to put them on any immunosuppression. So in those that are high risk, we usually jump to immunosuppression right away. Um, and for moderate risk, it's kind of case by case whether we put them on immunosuppression right away or we wait after observation. It's recommended if they still have nephrotic proteinuria, so that they're in that four to eight grams after six months of maximal medical therapy that they go ahead and get immunosuppression. And the first um, and second line therapy are uh, prednisone with the combination of cyclophosphamide. And this is a big distinguishing point between membranous nephropathy and minimal change in FSGS is that you have to use combination therapy. Um, I put uh, the calcineurin inhibitors, cyclosporin and tacrolimus here as kind of first and second line. Usually they're considered second line, but a lot of times we have, since this is a middle-aged group of patients, a lot of them have contraindications to steroids, so sometimes we go straight to that. And third-line therapies include rituximab, ACTH, and MMF. 